You know, sometimes I think we're a little too hard on ourselves. Yes, the world is garbage right now. Fascism is on the rise. We can't agree on anything. Clearly, we are not very good at this whole internet species thing. But really, why would we be? This level of connectivity that we're all living in right now, this has never been experienced in the entire 200,000 year history of our species. I mean, up until just a couple hundred years ago, the most anybody ever traveled was maybe one town over because the only way to get around was on a horse. And most people didn't even have that. Things had always been this way. They had never not been this way. Most people didn't even know how to read because everything they needed to know could be learned from the hundred or so people that they knew in the village around them. In every technological leap, in access to information has been followed by a period of social and political turmoil. I mean, look at the printing press. It was invented in 1440, and a few decades later, the Christian church split into Protestants and Catholics, and they've been fighting about it ever since. And of course, today we have these things in our pockets with a compendium of all human knowledge in it, and the ability to connect with literally anybody on the planet at the tap of a finger. And this is literally like 15 years old. And the internet that powers it is what, 30 years old? I mean, of course we're gonna be really bad at this. True story, I have been skiing once in my entire life, and uh, <laughs> it was a nightmare. I was falling over left and right. I literally couldn't go 10 feet without beefing it. It was super embarrassing. But the worst part of all was that for some reason, I thought I would be good at this. I'd seen skiing on TV and in the movies, it looked like a lot of fun. And you know, I played sports. I had good reaction times, whatnot. I rode a skateboard back in the day. I got this, man. <laughs> it, it turns out that sliding down a mountain covered with snow when you've lived your entire life in the flattest place on earth, which almost never gets any snow, is terrifying. It's like I was driving through San Francisco on black ice and bald tires. And I kind of melted down at the whole thing, actually, because I had this expectation, ridiculous expectation in hindsight, that I should be good at this. And yeah, I feel like that's how the whole world is with the whole internet situation right now. You know, we're really beating ourselves up for how badly we're bungling this. I've done plenty of it myself, but <laughs> we are literally learning how to share the planet with a digital superorganism, one that we created. So maybe the expectation that we should be good at this is as ridiculous as me thinking that I could ski. And yet we continue to lean into it because that's what we've always done. And despite the initial disruptions to the fabric of society over the long run, our quality of life has gone up because of it. And soon, if SpaceX has their way, the entire planet will be covered with fast, cheap satellite internet. That's the Starlink project that we all know about. But SpaceX isn't the only company working on a satellite internet swarm. There are several in the works, actually. So let's take a look at why this is such an attractive idea to these companies, which ones are likely to succeed, and what this means for the world as we know it. So everyone's pumped for satellite internet with Starlink, but uh, here's the thing. Satellite internet's been around for a while. In fact, Telstar 1, the first communication satellite from the US, launched in 1962, just four years after Explorer 1, which I talked about in my video last month about the Van Allen belts. It was designed at Bell Labs for AT&T, and it was the first satellite that beamed live TV to the US and Europe. It also carried the first satellite phone call, and it made the first satellite data transmission between two computers in 1962. So technically, there was satellite internet before there was internet. Unfortunately, Telstar 1 was functional for less than a year. And the reason for that uh, can also be found in my video about the Van Allen belts. I was talking about a nuclear test called Starfish Prime that was aimed at the Van Allen belts. I talked about it right here. They were testing to see if they could use the belts to create sort of a radiation shield to prevent missile attacks on ground-based locations below. Uh, it didn't work, but the EMP from the blast did manage to knock out one-third of the satellites that were currently in orbit. Yeah. This was one of those satellites. 18 months later, a satellite named CINCOM-3 became the first to launch in a geostationary orbit. It provided live coverage of the Tokyo Olympic Games. And this was a big deal because geostationary orbit means that the satellite is in the same position over Earth at all times. And it does this because it's far enough away from the planet that its orbital speed matches the speed of the Earth's rotation. It's really far away, like 35,786 kilometers far away, but it does allow you to send and receive messages 24 seven. Whereas a satellite in low Earth orbit would be whizzing by overhead and could only send and receive signals in short windows. Plus you can cover a massive area from geostationary orbit. In fact, it only takes three satellites to cover the whole planet. So yeah, the communications industry has been using 
geostationary orbit ever since, just kind of increasing the power of the satellites over the years to accommodate for the increased traffic. Just a quick side story here. When I was growing up, my grandparents had a ranch way out in the middle of nowhere and they didn't have access to any cable, so they had to use satellite TV. But this was way before like the direct TV dishes you see, you know, mounted on the side of people's houses. No, th they had a giant satellite dish. It was like eight feet wide and it was like out in the middle of a field. Like I could have recreated the poster of a contact with this thing. I'm not even kidding. And it was nuts because every time you change the channel, you could look out there and see it turning <laughs> and finding another satellite. That was a lot of work just to watch Tales from the Crypt, I gotta say. So yeah, these satellites provided live events and phone calls and movies young boys probably shouldn't be watching, but as the internet became a thing, that was on there too. In 1996, Hughes Network Systems launched the first satellite internet service called DirectPC. I mentioned DirectTV a second ago. Well, that was Hughes Network Systems. They, they created DirectTV in 1994. That streamed TV, DirectPC aired internet. Hughes Network Systems, by the way, they were a real pioneer in early satellite communication. That CINCOM 3 satellite that I talked about a second ago, the one that went to geostationary orbit, that was them. Um, or it, actually, it was their parent company, Hughes Aircraft Company. And if that name sounds familiar, that's because it was founded by Howard Hughes. Yes, the Howard Hughes, who Leonardo DiCaprio played in The Aviator, the guy from The Rocketeer, the Spruce Goose guy. You didn't think this was going to go all the way back to Howard Hughes, did you? Anyway, Direct PC launched a mixed reviews, but it was still faster than dial-up internet those days. But as terrestrial and DSL internet and cable started coming online, satellite started to fall behind. For two main reasons. The first is that satellite systems are just really expensive to upgrade. Case in point, HughesNet, which is what Hughes Network Systems goes by now. Uh, they have satellites capable of over 100 megabits per second download speed, but they only advertise up to 25 megabits per second. That's because they don't have enough satellites to give each customer full speed, so they have to kind of restrict how much each customer can get. They do hope to fix this with a launch this year, but this satellite costs the company $400 million. And that doesn't even count launch costs. Another company called Viasat is launching two satellites this year for the same reason. And uh, yeah, they're expecting to pay between $1.2 and $1.4 billion for the two of them. That is a lot of money for these companies to invest. And keep in mind, that'll only get their customers up to 100 megabits per second, which is way better, yes, but doesn't really blow your hair back when you compare it to like gigabit fiber services. So the expense of it all is the first problem. The second problem is latency. And this is just not something that's ever gonna be able to get fixed from geostationary orbit. Not without breaking the laws of physics. Latency refers to how long it takes a user to make a request from an internet provider's network and get a response. You can think of it as a time between clicking a link and the page opening. And yeah, when the nearest node to a provider's network is 35,786 kilometers above your head, Getting a response is just, it's gonna take some time. Like one way of looking at this is that if you wanna send a message via GEO satellite to somebody just a mile away, the distance it has to travel to get to that satellite and back is basically the same distance as if that signal had to travel all the way around the world, just to go one mile over. The absolute minimum latency for a GEO round trip is about 240 milliseconds. Now, HughesNet and Viasat are averaging around 600 milliseconds. In more real life terms, that's like just over half a second. Now in comparison, terrestrial internet can go as low as 10 milliseconds. In practice, anything under 100 is considered fine for everything except gaming. So half a second may not sound like a big deal, but satellite internet customers have been complaining about the latency problem since the early days of HughesNet. It's just clunkier, and especially as more work has gone online, more communication has gone online, this starts to matter more and more. And by the way, there are some financial applications where it can actually be a detriment. And yeah, the only way to fix this problem is to bring those satellites closer to the Earth. But if you're gonna do it from LEO, you're gonna need a lot of satellites. Where GEO satellites can hit one third of the planet from 36,000 kilometers up, something from lower than 2,000 kilometers in LEO can only hit a small area. Plus there's the fact that in order to stay in orbit in LEO, that small area is moving across the surface of the Earth at 25,000 kilometers an hour. So the only way to cover the entire circumference of the Earth is to have a bunch of satellites that can relay back and forth with each other. Basically passing the signal from one spot on the ground to another like a game of hot potato. This drastically reduces the distance the signal has to travel, but again, it takes a lot of satellites to do this, especially considering the Earth is a sphere. Now, in the interest of overcommunication, there are some orbits between GEO and LEO, like the Molniya orbits and the Tundra orbits that can provide full coverage with just a handful of satellites. Now, these are mostly used for GPS services, though. But the idea of an LEO constellation of satellites to provide internet service goes all the way back to the 90s. Teledesic was formed in 1994, backed by Bill Gates, and they planned to build a constellation of 840 satellites. This later got scaled back to 288 and then to none. The company folded in 2002. Several other companies have tried this as well, and they've all failed. 
the cost of launching that many satellites is just too much. The idea is solid. Everybody tends to agree that it would work and probably be better than geostationary satellites if anybody could afford to get them all up there. Which brings us to Starlink. SpaceX with their reusable rockets have brought the cost of launches down to the point that this crazy idea is actually kind of possible. Especially given the fact that the satellite technology has gotten smaller than ever before with CubeSats becoming popular, so you could launch hundreds of them at a time. So yeah, I mean, if you're SpaceX, it's kind of a no-brainer. Assuming it's that much better than traditional satellite internet. Right now, Starlink has around 2,000 Starlink satellites at 550 to 570 kilometers up and over 145,000 customers so far. And according to Ookla, they're averaging at around 97.23 megabits per second download speeds. For context, HughesNet's geostationary satellites are averaging 19.3 megabits per second. As for latency, a camper on Pikes Peak recently recorded between 34 and 36 milliseconds. Uh, but he was on a mountain, so... Now, SpaceX is promising that speeds will eventually reach 300 megabits per second, but as more customers use it, it's actually starting to get a little slower. Uh, but considering they still have like 40,000 satellites to go, it, it looks promising. No wonder Viasat tried to get their FCC license revoked. Yeah, last year they were part of a group of people that, that sued saying that Starlink launches were going to be bad for the environment. No conflict of interest there or anything. Actually, it, it, it gets funnier because those two super expensive satellites I was talking about earlier that they're scheduled to launch, they're going up on a Falcon Heavy. Conflict of interest, maybe, but uh, are they wrong? I mean, 42,000 satellites is a lot of satellites. <laughs> It's actually eight times more satellites than the number of satellites that were already in orbit when they first started launching Starlink in May 2019. Now, the reason for so many is because they want to create multiple shells of coverage with constellations at different altitudes. Current plans call for five shells, all with 20 vertical miles between them. Okay, so now might be the time to talk about the elephant in the room. From almost the very first Starlink launch, concerns have been floating around about what the effect of Starlink would have on ground-based astronomy. Especially some of the earliest prototypes, they actually reflected a lot of sunlight, and it had a lot of people worried about like what this was going to look like with the sky full of them. They have made progress since then to use um, less reflective coatings on there and put little visors on it to reduce the glare, but it's not perfect. And honestly, I never knew how to feel about this, because anytime you deal with something Elon Musk related, there's, there's so, it's so polarizing, and there's so many different things uh, flying around about it. It can be kind of hard to distinguish the signal from the noise. Like, I know that these bigger telescopes have powerful algorithms to account for different atmospheric disturbances. I just assume that they would have something like that for satellites as well. I mean, satellites have been up there for a long time, you know? So how much of a problem is this really? Well, I decided to ask somebody who knows far more about this than I do. So recently I had a talk with Dr. Becky Smethurst. Uh, she came on my podcast where we spent most of the time talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. But while she was there, I made sure to ask her about the Starlink problem. And here's what she had to say. I mean, if like all these companies were willing to share all of their like positional data, telemetry, that kind of stuff with like make it public, mm -hmm. we could have algorithms running in the background that could like send up an alert like oh a satellite is about to pass over your observation now mm -hmm. pause for a minute while it goes and then carry on which would be great now if you're looking at what's called an extended source like i do galaxies right they're extended over a, a quite a, a large patch of the sky you might be able to say okay i lost this section of the galaxy and I'll just get rid of that in that one. I'll add it together. But if you're looking at something that's much more concentrated, like a star, or say you're even looking at the tiny bit of light from the star that's passed through the atmosphere of the exoplanet that's orbiting around it so that we can look to see what's in that atmosphere, mm -hmm. that'll be completely lost. Like you, it would completely glare out that entire thing if it passed over. So it's not something we can correct for, but it's something we can avoid if that data is shared with us. Um, there is still an issue to astronomy and especially also to radio astronomy, because obviously mm. satellites do use light to communicate with the ground. It's just not yeah. visible light. It's usually radio waves because they're not impeded by clouds or anything like that. And so if you, you can imagine a satellite going over a telescope that's designed to be super sensitive, like you just get this huge spike of mm -hmm. noise that completely drowns out whatever you're actually trying to detect. They also have huge fields of view as well. They don't just concentrate down like optical telescopes do. Right. They tend to look at like, you know, a, a big patch of sky at once. And so limit, like 
limiting the interference from satellites going over this big patch of sky at once is a, is a huge deal, mm -hmm. especially when they're lower Earth satellites like these big constellations will be. So it's, it's a huge, huge issue. And I don't think it's one that's going to be solved overnight. I think optical astronomy probably can mitigate for it with if, it, if the data is shared and if we can do these algorithms. But I think radio astronomy will struggle even more. Interesting. And people are like, oh, well, who cares about radio astronomy? But it's like there's so much we study with radio astronomy, like yeah. fast radio bursts at the minute are the big one. You know, we still don't know, really know what they are. Um, you've then got all the, all the cool high energy stuff right? It's like quasars and pulsars mm. and, and like flickering uh, AGN as well. That's all radio waves. And so there's a lot we need radio telescopes for and to, and to understand as well. So it's not just something that you can necessarily dismiss. So it's not an insurmountable problem, but it is a problem. And while it might feel satisfying to point fingers at SpaceX and Elon, the fact of the matter is it might just be an inevitable problem. Because people have been wanting to do this for a long time, since before SpaceX even existed. And there are multiple companies working on something like this right now. So let's take a look at some of them. First up is Project Kuiper from Amazon. Project Kuiper was first announced in April 2019 with the goal of launching 3,236 satellites to an orbit of between 590 and 530 kilometers, so slightly higher than Starlink. But they will be using more robust satellites that can support up to 400 megabits per second download speed, which would be faster than Starlink. So far, Amazon has spent more than $10 billion on Project Kuiper, and there have been some bumps along the way, but they plan on launching two prototype satellites in the fourth quarter of this year. So as for who's actually gonna launch these rockets, right now they're using ULA's Atlas V and ABL Space Systems RS-1 rocket, but uh, I mean, you know once Blue Origin gets New Glenn off the ground, they're gonna be using that. At this rate, sometime in 2040, Regardless of what they launch on, though, their license with the FCC requires them to put at least half the constellation out by 2026. Uh, so we can expect to hear a lot more about this in the next few years. Another company working on a satellite constellation is OneWeb. OneWeb is based out of the UK, and at one point they were planning on launching a constellation of nearly 50,000 satellites. Then they went through some funding issues reportedly because of the pandemic, and this led to a bankruptcy. But once they came out of the bankruptcy, their plan slimmed down to about 6,372 satellites, of which so far they've launched 394. They're in a much higher orbit than Starlink and Kuiper at 1,200 kilometers, but so far they seem to be doing pretty well. A test in 2019 showed download speeds of 400 megabits per second with a 32 millisecond latency. Now, a more recent test in 2021 got 165 megabits per second and 45 milliseconds latency, so it's, it's clearly fluctuating, but it's competitive. Now, one thing that differentiates OneWeb from Starlink and Kuiper is they're targeting commercial uses instead of residential customers. Hughes Network Systems, which I mentioned before, is an investor in OneWeb, and according to the press release, they're targeting, quote, enterprise, government, commercial aviation, and maritime, cellular backhaul, and community Wi-Fi hotspots. Man, Hughes really wants to do this Constellation Internet thing. I guess they're convinced that it's... Boy, the future. And one more quick thing, because they're targeting commercial customers, they can charge more for their terminals. So their terminals are going to go between $1,000 and $1,500, as opposed to Starlink's terminals, which only go for $500. It should be noted, though, that SpaceX is actually selling their Starlink terminals for a loss right now. They apparently cost $1,300 to produce, but they're kind of making that gamble to get early adopters on board. And last but not least, we come to the Canadian company Telesat. Telesat's been a satellite communications company since 1969, and they were founded as a crown-owned company, meaning the government of Canada holds a significant interest. A deal in 2021 injected 1.44 billion Canadian dollars into the company. Uh, Canadian dollars are just like American dollars, except they're all stuck together from maple syrup. And most of that investment was there to fund Telesat's Lightspeed Internet Constellation. Much like others on this list, they've changed the proposed size of their constellation multiple times. In 2016, they announced plans for 117 satellites. This was later raised to 209, then 298, which is where it currently stands. But they applied to launch a total of 1,671 satellites just to ensure that they can meet future demand. 78 were slated to go out this year in 2022, but dates have slipped to 2023. And the reason for that is because they're supposed to go up on the new Glenn. But that's okay, they may actually need the extra time. They're running a little bit behind on getting the satellites built right now because of all the global supply chain issues. Like OneWeb, Lightspeed satellites will orbit at a higher altitude, around 1,000 kilometers, and they're expected to have latencies in the 30 to 50 millisecond range. Also like OneWeb, Telesat plans to target businesses and governments, as well as existing satellite customers like airlines and cruise ships. But here's the twist. One of the conditions of the government funding is that they also have to provide services to indigenous communities, which they would actually do a better job of because they're gonna be flying in a hybrid orbit that sweeps over the poles. So they'll cover areas that Starlink won't. 
So if we look at all these together on a chart, you can see that Starlink is way ahead of everybody else in terms of getting them up there and getting the service started. Um, but they are not specifically going to be the fastest one. Kuiper looks like it might be a little bit faster. And then the commercial services operations here, OneWeb is already in the lead. They've got some up there. Lightspeed hasn't put any up just yet. But let's just be honest, right now, if they don't have any satellites up, it's all just in the proposal stage. So Starlink is definitely in the lead. So that's what we can expect in the coming years. But before we wrap this up, there is one more concern that a lot of people have with these satellite swarms that is worth talking about. We already talked about the astronomy problem, but there is also the problem of what happens when there's this much stuff in space. You know, I've talked in here before about the possibility of the Kessler syndrome, which is when collisions in space create space debris, which creates more collisions and on and on until the planet's just trapped inside a shell of metal debris circling the Earth 15 times faster than a bullet, and that will basically shred anything that tries to pass through it. That's fun. Not only would it trap us here on Earth, but it would remove our ability to use satellites at all, which would be a massive setback for our species. There's, there's just a lot that we totally take for granted in our lives right now that are only made possible because of all these satellites circling overhead. And obviously doubling or quadrupling or octupling the number of these satellites in orbit only increases the potential for something like that to happen. So is this a bad idea? It's something to be concerned about, for sure, but one could make the argument that these low Earth orbit swarms might actually be safer in the long run than launching stuff up to geostationary orbits. Because satellites in low Earth orbit actually decay really quickly. Um, there's actually tiny amounts of atmosphere going up hundreds of miles that creates just a minute drag force in LEO satellites, and over time, it slows them down enough that they do eventually re-enter and burn up in the atmosphere. Satellites in the general orbit of Starlink might come down in a few years, maybe even less than a year. Whereas satellites in geostationary orbit are essentially there forever, like thousands of years. And for that, there is a company worth mentioning, and that's Privateer Space. Just launched last year and backed by Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, Privateer Space aims to be focused on, quote, space environmentalism. Their plan is to monetize the removal and recycling of space junk. How exactly they plan to do this has not really been announced, but uh, if you want to know more about it, their chief scientific advisor, Mariba Jha, talked about it on Star Talk. I'll put a link down below. It's probably way too soon to tell whether or not their plan is the ultimate fix for space, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how that comes along. So what's the verdict on these satellite internet swarms? Look, I'll be the first to admit, I am not the most bullish person in the world on Starlink. I never have been, personally. I don't, I don't think it's really a replacement for terrestrial internet. And like I said before, satellite internet's been around for a really long time. Like, is it really worth clouding our skies for a split second less latency? It just always seemed like more of a niche application to me, but... That's really easy for me to say, living in the middle of a city with gigabit internet service, you know? If I, if I lived out in the middle of nowhere or was in an underserved indigenous community, you know, something like this might be a godsend. Having access to cheap, fast internet anywhere in the world is probably a good thing. And with the workforce becoming more mobile these days, which has been completely accelerated by COVID, yeah, I mean, something like this might be a game changer. Like, I've become kind of fascinated by the whole van life movement lately and the fact that you can just kind of live and work effortlessly anywhere you want, you know? I have friends that are living like that and they send pictures of their office that day and it's always like, it's like they're working in a postcard or something, it's crazy. But I'm interested to hear what you think. Is this a service you could get some use out of? Are you a Starlink beta tester? And if so, what's your experience been with it? Or do you think it's just a dangerously ill-conceived idea that's gonna ruin astronomy and clutter up the skies? Discuss. Ultimately, I think the best argument for it is that it makes it easier for more people around the world to participate in the information age. And you can make things easier on yourself financially with today's sponsor, Wealthfront. All right, so longtime viewers of this channel know that I do not recommend anything that I don't use myself, and Wealthfront is no exception. So I'm getting up in the years, which sucks for a lot of reasons, but one of the good things about getting older is I'm finally at a place where I can start thinking about investing. But here's the problem with that. I don't like thinking about investing. I know some people love the thrill of the chase. They love doing the market research and getting in there and tinkering around. Well, if that's your thing, great, God bless. But I am not one of those people. I am not a gambler. I do not understand the allure of gambling. For me, it's just the most stressful way possible to lose as much money as possible. And I don't enjoy it in a casino and I don't enjoy doing it in the stock market. I just want to set my money aside somewhere that's relatively safe and with any luck might allow me to stop working before the age of 99. And that is exactly why I like Wealthfront. Wealthfront makes it easy to automate your investing by putting your money into a diverse portfolio of exchange-traded funds, or ETFs. When you sign up for Wealthfront, they have you answer a few questions to determine your risk tolerance, and then they create a portfolio specifically designed to help maximize your returns while managing your risk. If you're a high-risk, high-reward person, they might create a portfolio that's heavier on stocks, for example. 
Or if you're more like me, your portfolio might contain more bonds, for example. Or if you want to invest in companies you believe in, like sustainable energy companies or biotech, you can do that as well. And then once you build your portfolio, it's just set it and forget it. Their software monitors your portfolio and rebalances it to make sure it stays at the right allocations for you. And their software can even help you save money on your taxes through something called tax loss harvesting. And you can set it to automatically withdraw every month from your account so you can keep it growing with zero effort on your part. So if any of this sounds interesting to you and you want to check it out, just head over to invest.wealthfront.com slash Joe Scott and your first $5,000 of investment will be managed for free for life. Again, that's invest.wealthfront.com slash Joe Scott. It's super easy to get started and it's even easier after that. Now I get that not everybody is in a good place financially right now to start investing for the future, but if you can, as soon as you can, the more early you can get that money growing for you without having to spend time and energy sweating all over it, it'll pay off in the long run. So one more time, it's invest.wealthfront.com slash Joe Scott. Links down in the description. All right, big thanks to Wealthfront for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the community members here on YouTube who are contributing and forming a great community and just being awesome. And I wanted to shout out some new people that have come on board real quick. We got some new members. It's Josh Farmer, Earl Thomas John Michael Freeman, uh, Mike Reed, Nabirius SN, Pablo Medina, Slap Your Face, <laughs> love it, uh, Charles Mondragon, Deron Johnson, uh, Michael R. Coates, Wreckage Writer, Serafina Brocious, Sewer, Ellie Davlin, Laurie Doolin, Bobby L. Nelson, Laura Friesen, Sean Thompson, and KJF. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, just joining an awesome community, and as a member, you get a little, you get a little icon next to your name so you stand out. Makes you special. Uh, just click the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check this one out because Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the others down there that have my face on them. And if you watch it and you enjoy it and you want more, uh, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.